Hey everyone, Lizelle Crowley here at the Cool Tool Studio. Today I'm going to show you how to make a reversible lentil bead that can be worn on either side. Here's the bead we're going to make today. This side has a 3 millimeter cubic zirconia set in it and I used a texture tile. On this side I used a jewelry artist element of a tree. I drilled a hole and I attached a pinch bale. Let's get started. All right, so we're going to make a two-sided lentil bead and we're going to set a stone on one side. This is a great project for Easy 960 Sterling Silver Clay because the clay has such great finished strength. I also love the workability of this clay and it only shrinks 10%, so it's a wonderful option for this project. So we're going to use Easy 960 Sterling Silver Clay. When you form the two sides of the beads, you have to form them over a mold. You can use ping pong balls, light bulbs, but Cool Tool sells this wonderful little plastic um, mold that makes uh, is really stable and wonderful for drying the two sides of the bead. You're going to need your thickness frames, circle templates, and Cool Tools has this great set of circle templates that has the millimeters marked on it, so you know exactly what millimeter you're using what size circle you're using when you make the two sides of your bead. You want a work surface. I use the, the Cool Tools clay board. It's my favorite work surface. These are some three millimeter white CZs. For this project, I like a smaller um, cubic zirconia, but you can go up to maybe a five if you want. Um, a pinch bale for the finished product. You can use any combination of textures that you like. I like to use a different texture on each side. That way you have a completely reversible piece when you're done. So I'm going to use this tree on one side and this beautiful new texture on the other side. I also, you're going to need diamond tweezers for your stone and your ultra clay pick, an essential tool. It's nice to have this handy. You may or may not need it, but it's always good to have it on hand. Um, a clay hydrator, and this clay hydrator is great for long-term storage, but it's also great for when you're working. It allows the clay to stay nice and moist. And some cool slip. And also your um, big roller, which I really love. So let's get started. So the first thing we want to do is lubricate everything we're going to use. Um, I'm going to spray a little bit of cool slip on my palette and rub it around. Anytime I get a little excess lube on my hands, I just rub it into my hand in my rolling pin. I don't like to over lube, any, over lube anything, but a little bit um, is a nice addition to your is a nice addition to your work surface and your other tools. Now I'm going to lubricate both textures. When I lubricate a texture, I lubricate the whole thing, even if I'm not going to use the whole thing. When I'm rolling my clay on here, I never know how far it's going to go, and I want to make sure I don't have any sticking. If there's a lot of lube sitting on the surface of the texture, I'll just dab a little paper towel on it so there's not too much. Okay, so I've got that one done, and now I'm going to do my tree. In this case, I won't necessarily lube all the way over to here, but I will lube this entire section. Cool Slip is my favorite lubricant for textures. I, I like the lightness of it. I like how nicely it gets into all the crevices of the texture, and it really allows the clay to release beautifully. Again, I'm just going to dab up that excess clay. I'm sorry, excess lube. So now, when I'm creating a lentil, I work with the four card and two card frames. Whenever you're rolling a texture, you want to roll it smooth, one or two cards thicker than what you want to end up with. And now I'm going to do the tree first. So let's get this on the tree. And I'm going to take my two card texture, I'm frame, I'm sorry. When you are using the frame and rolling a texture, you want to make sure your frame sits on top of your texture tile. If your texture tile, if you're too close to the edge, you can always lay another texture tile next to it to get the proper depth. 
Always roll with one firm, even swipe when you're texturing. And there's that lovely, lovely tree. Now I'm going to use my circle template to cut out a circle. And I've decided to go with a 29 millimeter circle. And um, the nice thing about it is when I go to set my, when I go to cut my second circle, I'll know exactly what size I need to make it. Sorry, it took me a minute to find the circle I wanted. So I'm going to eyeball that and get it centered. And then I'm going to use my ultra clay pick to cut that out. When you use the ultra clay pick, don't press too hard. You want to feel it gliding across the work surface, but you don't want to press too hard. If you press too hard, not only will you scratch your work surface, but you'll cause a vibration in your needle tool. And that vibration will mean your cut won't be nice and clean. Take your excess clay away. I like to lift my piece with the scraper. It's better than using my fingers. And I'm going to bring my little mold up here. Because I've lubed all of them, I don't have to worry about which one I use. Try to get it centered on there. And very gently press it so that it conforms to the mold. You don't want to press too hard because you don't want to smush your texture but you also want to make sure it conforms all the way around. If it's not completely centered, you can slightly uh, move it. And I will look at it from the side to make sure that it is conformed completely to the mold. And once I have that done, I'll set that aside and I'm going to texture the other circle. So I've got my texture ready to go. It's already lubed. Always do all your preparation before you open your clay. That way you don't have to stop while your clay is out there drying. Again, I'm going to roll it first with four cards. And now I'm going to put it on this cool texture. I really love this texture. Get the two cards. And when you roll, you can texture towards you. I mean, you could roll towards you or away. This time I'll roll towards me. Again, a very firm, even swipe. Look at how cool that texture is. And you want to use the exact same size circle. So I've got the 29. And this texture I can use in a variety of different places. There's lots of places where it looked cool. So I'm just going to move this around and audition it until I find a placement that I really like. I think I'll go right about here. I'm going to anchor this down, cut my circle. Lift it up. and place it on my mold and make sure it conforms all the way around. Now I'm going to set a three millimeter cubic zirconia in one side of this lentil. At this point I want to make a decision where I want it to go because I want to put a little bit of a pilot hole. And I think I want my stone, there's, there's, a, there's many places it could go. I think it would look cool right in the center of the tree, almost like the tree is holding a, um, a piece of fruit. Or it could look cool in one of these areas where there's already a little circle. Um, but I will not do a stone on both sides because when you fire it, you have to have it on its um, laying down. And if you have it a stone on either side, you run the risk of the one on the bottom side falling out. So I usually only do a stone on one side. So I am going to go with... Um, I think I'll go with this. So I'm just going to cut a pilot hole at this stage. And it doesn't have to be very large. After it's dry, I'm going to drill that out both with a drill and a, a stone setting burr. Okay, so this is ready to go in the dehydrator and be dried. Or air dried if that's what you do. So here I have my two uh, domed pieces. 
and they're dried inside and out. So usually I'll dry them for five or ten minutes on the mold and then I'll take them off the mold so the inside can dry thoroughly. The next step is to, what I'm going to eventually do is bond these two molds, uh, these two domes together to create a um, lentil bead. But the first thing I want to do is sand a flat plane here so that as I bond together they have a nice surface to grab onto. And for this I'm going to use um, a sanding pad that's kind of large and the reason for that is I want to just rotate this on this sanding pad. And what I'm doing is you can see already that it's created a flat plane here. It doesn't take long. Um, this area was sitting up a little higher so that flat plane is a little narrower so I'm just going to concentrate on that area for a minute. Okay, and that gives me a nice flat plane. The other, I'm going to do the other dome. And again, I've got that nice flat plane there. This side here is just a little narrow, so I'm going to just do that to widen it. And now, when I put these together, you see it creates less of an edge. Okay? So now the next step is to join the two sides. If you have a texture that doesn't have a specific orientation, you don't have to be concerned about orientation as you're joining them together. But as with the tree, when you hang this pendant, you don't want it hanging off. You want it to hang upright so you know where the top of the pendant needs to be. If the other side had a specific orientation, then I would be very concerned about making sure those aligned properly. So I would mark with just a Sharpie um, where the top of each is so that as I join the two pieces together I could align them. However, this side the orientation doesn't matter to me. I think this would look fine no matter how it was oriented. So I'm just going to join these pieces together without marking. I'm going to use a generous amount of water and brush around that edge. Now it's okay if excess water gets in the middle there, it won't hurt anything. But I want to make sure I have a generous amount of water around that edge. And I'm going to place the two pieces together and hold. I want to make sure that um, it's even all the way around. And I also want to look at it from the side and make sure I don't have any openings or gaps. Once I have that done, this goes back into whatever drying uh, apparatus you use. I use a dehydrator and it dries for another 5-10 minutes and then we'll do a further sanding. So here we have the piece. It's been bonded together uh, and dried and you can see sort of a gap in between the two sides. So the next step is to sand that gap away so that it looks like one solid piece rather than two pieces that have been stuck together. For that, I'll use this super fine sanding pad, but cut, cut into a smaller size so it's easier to handle. And I'm just going to start sanding. And as I sand, I'm going to rotate and keep moving my bead, just as with anything round. If you stay standing in two pl one place too long, you're going to um, lose that perfect roundness, and you don't want to do that with these. So I'm rotating both the sanding pad and the bead as I sand. I'm, I'm going like this with my sanding pad and I'm going like this with my bead. So um, I'll show you how it's starting to develop. This is what I'm looking for right here. You can see no gap. Um, this you can sort of see a line and this you can still see a gap. So I still have a bit of sanding to do. Um, but it's, it, it doesn't take super long and so I'm just going to continue. And you don't want to use too heavy a grit on this because you want it smooth, you don't want it roughed up. So you stop periodically and check it. And when it looks seamless all the way around, then you're ready to go to the next step. The next step is to set our stone. And we have 
both a hand drill, and this hand drill is fantastic because all of the drill bits store in the back, so you will not lose them. This is very important. And it's just a pin vise. It's very easy to change the belt, drill bit. You just um, turn it and remove the bit, and then you tighten it once the bit is in. So where I put my pilot hole, I'm just going to drill it out first with this. to make a nice clean hole. And then I'm going to take my three millimeter uh, stone setting burr and I'm going to drill it out to accommodate the stone. This is a great um, tool because you can stabilize it in your hand and turn like this and it gives you a nice stable um, grip on the tool while you're drilling. Now you don't want to drill all the way through. You want to drill down far enough so that when you set your stone in, the girdle of the stone is under the surface of the clay. So you see, it only took me a minute. I'm going to take my little three millimeter stone and set it in there. And because the piece is um, dry, if I don't get it in perfectly straight at first, I can move it around. And what I'm looking for is, is the girdle of the stone under the surface of the clay. And I can see that it is. So this is right where I want it. I don't know if the camera can pick that up. But you want to look at it from the side, from this angle, so you can see if the girdle is under the surface of the clay. So that's ready to go. The final step is to drill the lentil so that you can hang it. Now, there are a couple of ways you can drill it. You can drill it from side to side so that you can put beading wire through it or chain through it. You can drill it from top to bottom so you can put a head pin or something and create um, maybe a decorative bead element on the bottom and a loop on the top. Or you can drill front to back and then attach a tube bale to it. And that's how I prefer to finish these. Because um, this is the side that I want it oriented to with the tree, I'm going to drill from this side. And I'm going to start with a finer drill bit because I don't have a pilot hole. Now, why didn't I drill a pilot hole when the clay was wet? Because I had no way of knowing how to perfectly align them. Um, I find that it's better to um, just take a moment to do it this way than it is to try and align two pilot holes. So I'm attaching the finer drill bit. You want to make sure you get that in the center there so it drills straight. Okay. And I'm going to come about an eighth of an inch away from the edge and just start to drill. And you'll feel a sort of a pop when it goes through. I just felt the pop. And now I'm going to drill through the other side from the top. And I felt that pop. So you can see it's going all the way through. Okay. Now I'm going to come back in with a larger drill bit so I can make a hole that will accommodate my pinch bale. So I'm changing my drill. And for this, I'll drill from either side. So first I'll drill the top. And it only takes a minute to enlarge the hole. And then I'll go to the other side and I'll drill the bottom. Now, you may notice that my stone popped out. That's not an issue. I can pop it back in before I fire. So this is now a nice clean hole. And after firing, the pinch bell can go right in there. Okay. So I'm going to pop my stone back in. Now because I didn't do any wet work with the stone, I don't have to clean it off with alcohol. There's no really no clay residue on it. So this is ready to fire. So this will get fired at the Easy 960 firing schedule and then we'll polish it and add the bale. Okay, so here we have the finished lentil. Here's the side with the tree on it. And here's the other side with the stone and the other texture. And to finish it off, I'm just going to attach this pinch bale. And I made sure that the, um, the pegs would fit in this hole 
that I created for the, um, for the lentil. So I'm going to use my Lindstrom pliers. And just align the pegs over the hole. And pinch it in. There we go. So here's the finished lentil. I think it turned out great, don't you? Look at how nice that little CZ sparkles in there and how beautiful the texture looks. And the tree gives such an elegant look on the other side. The pinch bale really nicely complements the piece and it can be worn either way. Visit our learning center at cooltools.us for more cool jewelry making videos. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and be sure to sign up for our email list to be the first to hear about new videos, new products, and other cool stuff from Cool Tools.